Jerry Blevins is back for another episode of the Shane Inning Podcast. Lots to discuss, as always. What's going on with this team offensively? Position players pitching. What are his thoughts on it? Also, what has he thought about the sticky inspections? Umpires checking out pitchers, their hands, their gloves, their belts. It all starts right now. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. Doug Williams and Jerry Blevins with you. Uh, A reminder to subscribe to the Shannon Podcast wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, wherever, and rate and review us as well. We appreciate it. It's brought to you by Verizon, 5G built right for the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon. Um, Jerry, good to have you back. Uh, Can I start with the the movie recommendation from last week? And, And I watched it two nights ago sat down and I watched everybody want some. And it was exactly what you described. But by the way, Jerry, what I loved about it was there's really no plot. Yes, like, thank you. It's, it's just like baseball players bullshitting for an hour and a half or two hours or however long it is. And, and there's a character in it who is Anthony Wrecker. And there's also a character in it who I think is you. <laughs> I, like you know the um the kind of he's definitely a junior or a senior he's got like long blonde hair and he's a left-handed pitcher that reminded me of you and the lead i could not get it out of my head how much he looks like record but i very much enjoyed it good i'm glad you enjoyed it it really is it's such a strange movie because you there is no plot it's just like a uh, a snapshot of a moment in time that, that he, they just capture the banter, the back and forth between, you know, baseball players. And to make that into a film, like I, I didn't recommend it a ton to people beforehand because I was like, maybe it's just for guys like me that have been around. And then I, I talked to some of my friends and, and people that didn't play baseball and they're like, no, it's like super enjoyable. And so I, I've, I've started to expand, you know, recommending that to, to other people. So I'm glad you liked it, Doug. Yeah. And it's not just like, it's not just corny. Like a lot of baseball movies are and totally unrealistic. Like for example, I love uh, when the captain senior stands up and is like, uh, guys, uh, optional means mandatory. Like those things that people actually say. And like, it's not just like a corny baseball movie. There's actual stuff in it that you can tell people did their research and probably a lot of the actors were former baseball players and understood the mannerisms and the way that those guys talk. Nailed it. Good. I'm glad you liked it. And you did your homework. I'm very proud of you. Yeah. Look, I had to start things on a good foot, you know, (laughs) um, but by the way, be sure to check out an all new episode of SNY's digital series uh, about the Mets farm system. It's Mets perspective. Uh, it's also presented by Verizon episode four as a deep dive on uh, Eastern league player of the week, Mark Vientos, check it out now, SNY.tv. So Jerry, that was last week's or two weeks ago, rain delay recommendation. I watched, I enjoyed, I hope some of our listeners did too. What's uh, what do you got today? So this week's rain delay recommendation from Jerry Blevins is whiplash. It's a 2014 movie nominated for the 2015 best picture jk simmons wins for supporting actor um damien chazelle goes on to make la la land in a couple of years and wins best director but to me this is a masterpiece this is a movie that takes place in a jazz conservatory about a drummer but ultimately to me it's a sports movie like this is a sports movie this is a a very talented athlete that plays the drums and J.K. Simmons plays this coach or his teacher that's just this overbearing, controlling, he's a, like, I don't know how to describe it, but other than he is such a dick in this movie and he plays it so well. Um, It's a masterpiece. I I was partial to it. I played the drums in high school, um, a part of like being at a small school, I get to play all the sports and I don't have to say no to anything. So I got to be a drummer in the band as well. And I love it. Um, so I, I appreciate that approach. But this movie is wonderful. It's full of tension and grit 
Uh, it's got Paul Reiser who, who makes a, an appearance as the main character, Miles Teller's dad. It's, it's lovely. It takes place in New York City, so there's a little bit of the backdrop. But this is a, a great movie. Have, have you seen it yet? I have been. It's on my list. So now I will watch it. You know, this good, is going to be so a I beautiful you... thing. I, I'm a fan of this because now I just, I'm being forced to watch some of the movies that I've really been wanting to watch. Whiplash being one of them. So this is working good. out. So well this is too. like a, this is a, a, a music movie, but to me it's a sports movie because I've had some experience with coaches like this and it's how you respond. Ultimately, is it, does the end justify the means? So this is really good. I can't wait to talk to you about it. Yeah, and and for the record, the movies, I, I understand your point and I appreciate it about how it's a movie about, you know, uh, conservatory and, and it's about the drums, et cetera. But your movie recommendations do not have to be sports. Um, I think... I think it's uh, it's whatever you want it to be. I'm sure our listeners would appreciate your recommendations, no matter what theme or what they're about. That's good. Like I don't, I wouldn't call this a sports movie, but to me, it is a sports movie because it, it relates, especially to that the the player coach kind of dynamic, and uh, it's just a beautiful movie. It was a, a nominee. It was Damien Chazelle's, you know, debut directorial debut, and man, he made a he made a splash coming out. Love it. Can't wait. All right, let's do a three batter rule, Jerry, and we'll start with uh, the offense. Now, Andy and I were talking earlier this week about how even good teams, uh, when there's one part of your team that's carrying you for as long as the Mets starting pitching a bullpen has, usually that starts to falter and maybe the offense picks things up like the way that it ebbs and flows during a season. Is there any, like when the offense is struggling, take me inside a clubhouse. Like, is there tension uh, when, you know, the position players are really struggling and maybe they're tight and the pitchers are kind of like, yeah, we're, we're carrying this thing. I mean, back to your movie recommendation. I love the tension between the pitchers and the position players in everybody wants some. And I, yeah, I feel like that, translates well into what I'm asking about this current Mets team. Uh, yeah. So on a bad team, there definitely feels like there's this tension because pitchers are carrying the team and the offense is struggling behind on a bad team with bad people and, a, and no leadership that could carry over. You get guys like, man, you know, we're going to carry you again. You get guys say hop on our backs once more. Um, but that's not a problem. The only, you know, the pressure is going to come internally from the offensive players. They won't, they haven't carried it out to their defense. They've played great defense. You know, Conforto made another spectacular catch yep. uh, in right field. Um, Dom Smith made a great catch the other day and, and left. Like the people are still playing up. The offense is definitely lagging behind, but again, they're, they're still in first place. They're, if they, they want to win a championship, they're going to have to start hitting. Um, so the tension is, is definitely internal on themselves. And and you're just pulling for each other. You understand that, that you're going to go through these ebbs and flows. And I think during this tough stretch at some point, if the, if the hitters don't break out, you're not going to win a World Series anyway. And so guys are like, look, if, you, if we want to be a contending team, we're going to have to pull it all together. So they're just focused on doing their jobs as best they can. What concern level should the average fan at home have with uh, whether it's a certain specific hitter or an offense in general during slumps? Like, do you think that we are too in the weeds and we get too lost in the moment and we're like, oh my gosh, is, why is this guy hitting 210? Um, like, do we overreact to the daily grind of baseball? And when you're actually playing it, it feels like, oh, I'll get out of this. No big deal. Uh, normally, I would say that most people overreact. I think it's, it's common because you, you see something happen, you know, from an individual hitter. But I think it's fair for, for uh, Mets fans to be concerned because the offense as a, as a whole – is down. Like if it were just one player that, that was, wasn't hitting, you know, you can either, you know, lose that spot in your lineup, but when it's a significant portion of your offense, there's reason to be concerned on a, on a grand scale, because if you want to, like I said, if you want to be a world series team, 
you're going to need some guys to step up and, and the offense to carry you, especially coming with, you know, the, some of the injuries and the starting rotation, they're going to have to throw the team on their back and, and they're built for it. They just haven't done it yet. So if they don't break out soon before the all-star break, you, you would hope going into the second half after they finally get some rest from this tough stretch of games that they can throw the, the defense on their back. They can allow the pitchers to, to kind of take a deep breath and, and not have to be perfect in order to win a ball game. That, I, I would say that that's kind of why I haven't overreacted because if, if this was a team built on pitching, which is a, a, an important distinction and their lineup was never going to be the strength. I'd be like, yeah, this is a problem. Like we knew they needed hitting. Maybe they acquire something or, you know, they might be screwed, but this is a lineup that I think we all expected to score runs. I mean, they're deep, they're versatile, uh, dynamic. I, I just don't think there's a, a, a world where in two months, Dom Smith, Pete Alonso, Francisco Lindor, Nimone Davis when they come back, um, like Conforto, they're going to put it together. It's just a matter of like what worries me and what I keep saying in every episode of this podcast is that the pitching is carrying them. They're already pushing Taiwan Walker back because he does not have a track record of going deep into seasons and throwing a lot of innings. Uh, DeGrom is doing what he's doing with his own body. He's got his health issues. So it worries me that it's starting to pile up and you're already seeing like Trevor May went through his blips. Miguel Castro's had some problems. Jerry's familia is already on the injured list. Like you're already seeing what happens when a group of your team carries you for so long. But having said that, I, I have no reason to believe the track record is there for so many of these hitters. They will be fine. Um, so I'm with you there. Um, it is funny, though, to be preaching optimism, Jerry, coming off of the fact that the Braves scored 20 runs last night. And the, the, the second of our uh, three batter rules, Albert Almora, who, you know, classic position player pitching last night, almost looked like he did not feel comfortable just throwing from a stopped position. Like he would have really liked to crow hop if he could. <laughs> um, what, what are your, like position player comes up to you is like, Hey man, any advice? I'm going out there for the first time. Like, what do, what do you tell a position player in terms of like what to bring to the mouth? Well, first I would tell them a, your number one job is to not get hurt. You know, that's, that's number one. We, we don't want you throwing as hard as you can. Uh, if you flash back to like Jose Canseco, when he first got a chance to pitch, he's so excited. He ended up tearing his UCL and having to have Tommy John surgery. Like this is now this is in everybody's head as a, a manager, when you, bring in a position player to pitch, you're like, just don't, don't get hurt. Don't make my job harder. Like this is just finish the game or finish the inning and let's go. Um, that my first advice would be don't go, don't try to throw as hard as you can, unless you do this regularly. The second is to like put some effort into it. I want to see you try to get people out. You remember a couple of years ago, Jose Reyes got to pitch. He got his butt kicked, but he tried. He was throwing some breaking balls. He was trying a little bit of two-seamer. He was putting a little bit of velocity behind it. These are big league hitters. And so you're still going to, you know, get hurt. Like they're, they're you're going to give up hits, but I want to see you try. Like if, uh, if I were a position player and I got to ask to pitch, I'm going to, you know, flash back to my high school days and I'm going to try to throw a breaking ball. I'm going to try to mix speeds. I maybe even throw a little Johnny Cueto, you know, a yeah. little butt waggle, uh, mix that in uh, just to have fun with it and really try to embarrass yourself um, or try to embarrass the other hitter. You saw when <laughs> when Anthony Rizzo struck out Freddie Freeman, like he has bragging rights over, you know, the reigning MVP that like, hey, dude, you're not that good. Uh, I struck you out and I don't do this. Like those are those are chance to like bury another player and just carry those rights because he's never going to pitch against you. The odds are astronomical. So I, I'm all about it. I like seeing it, but I want you to, to go up there and not just lob the ball. Right. So don't get hurt, but don't lob the ball. There, there's don't get little... hurt, but compete, be a competitor, right. go out there and, and try to get some people out, try to try to miss some bats. What's funny is I, I'm only picturing like the teams I played on growing up, my high school team, and don't most like 
professional baseball players, like big leaguers, weren't they so good growing up that they probably pitched? Like to your point about seeing, like going back to your high school days, do you think like Anthony Rizzo, for example, don't you think he pitched at some point, at some level? Like he's too good of an athlete and too good of a baseball player. That 100%, definitely. Especially guys like our age, like a little bit older, we never had to specialize. We were probably one of the top two or three best players on your team. So you're going to be one of the best pitchers, especially if you're left-handed like Rizzo. So you're going to pitch in today's game. A lot of the young guys specialize super early and they don't, you know, maybe they're not pitching, but the, the odds are at least at some point, you know, during their lives, they were a good pitcher. And so to not carry that over, I take it like for me, when I, when I would go to hit, it's kind of the same thing. I'm not trying to hit a home run. I know that I could tear an oblique doing that, but I'm also going to put good swings on it. I'm going to try to make contact. If a manager was like, do not swing. I tell you what, I'm going to swing. I don't, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to swing. I, I, my, I got four at bats in my whole career. I'm going to try to get a hit because getting a big league hit is amazing. And I think getting a hit is probably equal to from a position player pitching is to striking a guy out. So I'm going to try to strike a guy out. You know, you're not going to jeopardize your career and get hurt, but you're going to, you're going to try to get somebody to, to swing and miss and, and put that strikeout in your, you know, in your trophy case. Tommy Hunter got his first big league hit earlier in the season and like lost his mind. He was so excited. That was yeah. a reminder to me that like at that point when we're watching the game, we're like, Oh my God, this is hysterical that this guy's hitting, but it's a cool moment. Like, you don't ever think that's going to come. So that's what Tommy Hunter said. He's like, he's a little older towards the end of his career. And he got a big league hit and he was like emotional about it. He was talking about how he, his wife and his kid were so excited. Like, I loved that. Yeah, that's, those are the moments. I guarantee you if Almora got a strikeout, he would be so pumped, like pumped. It would be one of those moments. So I, I, I appreciate the fact that he's going out there and doing his best not to get hurt. But I also feel for the man as a competitor because he's probably been told not to do something. And in his head, he's like lobbing the ball going, come on, let me let me just let me have a little bit of a shot here. So uh, nice segue into our third of the three batter rule. I I'm guessing they even if I'm, we didn't see it, but they didn't inspect Albert Almora for sticky stuff. I don't think they thought he was. Uh, trying to doctor the baseball. But so since we last spoke to you, we've seen these, you know, these checks get implemented. And I don't know. I mean, look, there were some examples with Scherzer and Joe Girardi losing his mind at Kevin Long. Uh, the Josh Donaldson thing with Lucas Giolito the other night, I was really intrigued by that. And if in case anyone listening didn't see it, Donaldson hit a homer and then on his way back to the dugout was yelling, he's not sticky anymore. And like gesturing to his hand, Giolito was not pleased. Um, so what have you thought about the way this has felt Jerry? And can you put yourself like as the, in a competitive mindset, you're coming off after a big Bryce Harper strikeout, like you did so many times and you're on your way back to the dugout and the umpire says, Jerry, Jerry, can you come here for a second? What would that be like to you? I mean, that, it would be fine. I think I would handle it like uh, like Mr. Bushlight, Aaron Loop, and just be like, you know, it's part of the game. It, it's part of your job. You know, like Shohei Otani, super, you know, super gentleman about it. Just here you go. What am I going to do? Um, Scherzer getting upset, I think, was more uh, towards Girardi um, and not without merit. Uh, Romo just doing Romo things and, and having a yard sale. But ultimately, I think... <laughs> I think we need to move forward. I don't think you need on-field checks every time. This is something that could be done. Joel Sherman wrote a piece the other day. It was talked about you could pre-check their hats and their gloves for pitchers, you know, let them go. And then they have – you can get the spin rates in real time. And so you monitor that. If there's a weird variation of all this data that you've collected – then you could have somebody like the, the MLB umpiring crew in Chelsea, uh, the replay crew, watch this pitcher and to see if he's going for a substance, you know, if he's trying to apply it and then check him afterwards. So I think you can do this, eliminate the on-field, you know, checks. I think nobody wants to see that. Nobody cares. It's not necessary anymore. You can, you made your point. I think 
that, that you're enforcing it. Now let's look for variations in, in spin rate and then target those individuals. Let's get rid of the on-field checks until somebody shows some type of su suspicious activity or behavior. You know, it's your point about Sergio Romo and the full yard sale. We should have known that guys like Sergio Romo and Max Scherzer wouldn't handle it well. Like there's just always, there's pitchers, every pitcher is wired differently. Um, but Max Scherzer is like the ultra competitive, like insane uh, guy that never wants a distraction. And Sergio Romo is just like the most, um, I don't know how to describe it, like super emotional, but just hops all over the mound. And like, he's just very, what's the word that I'm looking for? Well, how would you describe Sergio Romo? Uh, <laughs> not in one word. I, I think the word would just be like energetic. Like yeah. he's, he's all in on whatever's happening. And if you're asking him to do this, he's going to give you everything. And so he's like, Oh, you want to check this, check my whole body. You know, if yeah. you want me to throw a slider, I'm going to throw the nastiest slider I can. So he's doing things at a hundred percent. So maybe, you know, maybe uh, all gas, no break for Mr. Romo. Yeah. It, it's just, it's kind of a, it's a personality thing with these pitchers mm -hmm. and how they handle it. Aaron Loop was like borderline, uh, like honored to be checked. Shohei Otani thought it was kind of funny. Uh, everybody's handling it differently, and we're kind of learning about their personalities in the process. But um, I think uh, you're right; it it can be tweaked, and that's kind of the the point that I can't get over, Jerry. Is that obviously it can be tweaked? It was just implemented and like it was cobbled together, like it's not like they really thought this through. So obviously it's not perfect because major league baseball was like, Oh gosh, we have an issue. Let's make this as public as possible and just tell these umpires who are professionals at what they do to start doing something they're totally uncomfortable with. And let's ask the players to do something they're uncomfortable with. It is, uh, it's so obvious for me to say, yeah, it's a, it's a, an imperfect way. Obviously they just came up with it on the fly. Yeah, I, I think I think there's a little bit more. I don't think it was as thrown together as, as you might think. I think well, MLB it certainly really looks this, like it. I think MLB really used this again. I'm I'm a union guy till I die, but I think MLB used this to try to put a little, you know, to vilify the players a little bit. Look, these guys are cheating. We're going to try to embarrass them. This is about them. It isn't about us it's not our fault that the ball's slippery and these guys are you know cheating it has nothing to do with us look at these guys cheating look at them look at the players vilify them i think it i think it was a little bit of of gamesmanship with the cba coming up to to kind of maybe put a shadow on the players a little bit but um i don't think it's necessary anymore i think you could take it off the field until like i said until somebody shows a spike in real time spin rate between pitches or something off of their mean, um, I think we can move forward and, and get rid of it. Nobody wants to see it. I, I made a reference the other day to drug tests. Like you, steroids were a problem. PEDs were and are a problem. And, and the fans want to get have the players be tested, but they don't want to see us pee in a cup. You know what I mean? You don't need to see it. Just knowing that it happens is enough. So let's stop showing people that you're checking for substances and just knowing that it happens is enough. Once again, you're listening to Shane Anything Podcast. It's brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets from the network more people rely on only on Verizon. And a quick additional programming note, Subway Series is on deck this weekend. Mets, Yanks, Friday night on SNY coverage starts. Baseball night, New York at 6. Mets pregame 6.30, taking you to the game at 7. Once again, on SNY. So I'm, I'm going to call an audible for the rest of the podcast, Jerry, kind of, sort of. Um, I have two players that I want to talk to you about. One of them just occurred to me when you were talking about a union guy till you die. And then David Peterson afterwards, who we were planning on talking about. So Michael Conforto, we were talking about this on the show the other night, that he must be putting a lot of pressure on himself because he just got hurt. He's in a contract year. He's a Boris client. He's a player rep, Correct. So do you think that Michael Conforto is an, an additionally, uh, I don't know, stressed or, or it, it, it like preoccupied with the fact that he's going into this offseason full of unknowns, given that he's a player rep, 
he has no idea how the negotiation is going to go with the CBA. Like, where do you think he is mentally right now? Yeah, I mean, the the CBA stuff is definitely a, a piece of it. There's a lot, but he has alternates that he can pass it on to. And the union would never put him in a position to where he feels uncomfortable on the field. So if he needs to take a step back, he can do that. Um, he's not going to put too much on his plate from that standpoint. As far as trying to play for a contract, you know, I have no idea what that's like because he's such a better player than I was. The, the, the dollars in between are beyond. Like I couldn't imagine the pressure of trying to play, you know, for, for a contract like that. I've seen it affect people in different ways. I do know that Conforto looks amazing. Like I think he's playing great baseball. He taken some balls up the middle, like really looks good at the plate. He's playing spectacular defense I, I'm excited. You know, the injuries are, are something that are, are unpredictable. And I think he's done more than enough to, to kind of combat those. They're going to happen if, if they do. They're kind of a freak thing. But I think he looks amazing. I, I, I think he looks really good. I would be happy as a fan to see what's coming from him, his effort level. He's not making mental mistakes. He's, he's got a good approach at the plate. And I think it's all going to come – together as long as he stays healthy moving forward yeah I just I guess I I put myself in his shoes with the the stress of to your point a level of contract that is insane to us normal people Uh, but also knowing the way he does how tenuous a situation it is and what what is it going to be negotiating contracts this offseason when when the CBA is up and uh, I just I think he must have mentally a lot on his plate I, I think the key, the key being is once you step onto the baseball field or you get into the clubhouse, all of that goes away. All the stress is what if you, you have a family member that's sick or, you know, your wife's pregnant. Once the game is about to start, all that goes away. These are these are big time athletes. Michael Conforto showed it as a rookie, you know, on the chase to the World Series, how focused he can be. All of the other stuff goes away. You're able to wash it away. And you live in that moment. It's almost a sanctuary to get away from everything that's going on and to just play the game. So when it comes to pressure filled situations, I have no doubt that Conforto is going to excel in those moments. Um, apart from playing from for the contract, those are things that, that maybe get to other people. You know, you look at Lindor, he's got the, a very similar pressure of trying to live up to a contract. And you've got guys in all gamuts that have to play to some sort of you know, pressure and you either thrive in it or you don't. And I think in Fordo's shown that he thrives in it and I, uh, I'm excited for him. I appreciate you making the reminding me. Yeah. Um, players who are, who are that good professional athletes aren't, aren't like normal people and can just like totally zone in. And that's always a good reminder. They're, they're barely human. So let's do the hook. David Peterson, uh, he left with an injury to his side. Mets are already saying he's not going to make his next start. Um, again, an injury that the Mets did not need. I said on Baseball Night in New York last night, you can make the argument he's one of the most important players on their roster, given that like we all know the big three in their rotation, but he can kind of bridge that gap between like the back end and he looked so good his last three starts and last night, obviously being a setback, then he leaves the game with the injury. But Jerry, one of the things that we actually did talk about on BNNY last night was that the Mets looked smart for not sending him down because that was something we had talked about mentally. It's, it's had to have been a grind. He did not have it so many times out this year and was getting hit around and he's young. He, he skipped a step in the minors do you send him down? The Mets did not do that. He looked more and more effective. Tell, talk to me about what you think the, the, the status is of a pitcher in his position mentally. Uh, so mentally, I think, you know, apart from the injury, like this is this, the latest injury is something that's a, it's a hiccup. It's, it doesn't seem like it's a big deal. You know, he might miss the start. He might even miss the rest of the first half until the all-star break. Who knows? Um, He'll be fine. It it didn't look like a, like a serious injury, you know, knock on wood, but he is going to miss a start or two. But as far as overall, I think he has 
been given a chance to grow on the mound in the big leagues. Um, and it's been huge for him, like to be on a contending team like the Mets and to be a young guy coming in and having a lot of this pressure, you don't get a chance to have growing pains in the big leagues. The, this doesn't happen. You saw it with a lot of, you know, pitchers in the Atlanta bullpen because they're contending. They've had a lot of young guys that have potential to be successful. And, and like from Kyle Wright and Bryce Wilson, these guys that, that they're going to count on or that have a chance to be great starters they don't get a chance to develop like, like what um, Peterson's had because they need wins. You need a, you need to win. And for him to be able to, for the Louis Rojas and Zach Scott and the crew to allow him to have these growing pains in the big leagues are so huge for his development. He's learning how to pitch in the big leagues consistently. Mm. If you're constantly worrying about going up and down, that wears on you. And those are, those are learned things like, I got to learn how to pitch in the big leagues and, and have these growing pains in, in Oakland without a spotlight, a huge spotlight on a team that wasn't contending. And they let me learn what it means to be a big leaguer and be successful at this level. Um, and for Peterson, you know, some of these injuries in the rotation have been great for him. You know, it's not great for the team, but there's less pressure on him because they're like, Hey, who are you going to send me down for? Yeah. You need me. So, and I'm sure Louis Rojas went up to him and be like, look, man, I know you're going through a rough time, but you're our guy. You're going to be here. We need you. So just figure it out. Don't worry about whether or not you're going to go back down to AAA or your apartment gets moved. Just know that you're going to learn and you're our guy. And I think it's been huge for his development, for him to bounce back. Like you said, these last three starts were wonderful. Those are, those are moments that are going to push him for his career be like, look, this team counted on me. I got to learn what it, what it takes to, to be successful, how to make adjustments and, and go on. So I think, I think the Mets have done him a great service and he's paid them back um, showing that he's, he's not only capable, but a, a great pitcher with a chance to be a true one, two, three guy. I, I love that perspective that it's actually a, a service to him to be learning at the big league level. I've always viewed it as like an unnecessary challenge. Send him the minors, like let him figure it out there. But to your point, struggles at the big league level are um, like the learning curve is so valuable uh, to a young pitcher. So I will always view that differently now, which is a really cool thing. Like I, I, I have been one of those guys in the media who will just kind of look at it so simplistically like struggling minors. But if to your point, there's nobody better, he knows it, Rojas knows it, Zach Scott knows it, then like he's got the confidence at least to be like, I don't care. Like I'm not even putting pressure on myself in terms of the results. I'm just going to pitch, try and improve myself and know that I'm a valuable commodity to the Mets organization. They believe in my future. I, I think that that's really important that, that our listeners hear that, that yeah. um, that's the mindset of a young guy who knows that his organization believes in him and how valuable that is just mentally for a big leaguer. Yeah. I think he's going to show the Mets invest in him and he's going right. to, he's going to let that investment pay off and he's going to, it's going to make him better for all the years that the Mets are going to have. Him. All right, Jerry, before we go, uh, we need a baseball story. Again, this is, we told Jerry uh, one per podcast until he runs out, which maybe one day he will, but what do you got for us today? So last episode, I, I gave you the option of the Ken Griffey Jr. The Jim Tomey. And That's you chose correct. Ken Griffey Jr. So I'm going to tell you the Jim Tomey story. So I'm in Ohio. My mom or my brother's a Reds fan. My mom's an Indians fan. Like these are our Ohio teams, right? And we're in Chicago. I'm with the A's. Jim Tomey's playing for the White Sox. And my whole family's in Chicago. It's a, a much closer drive um, than Oakland. So they, they come to those games on the road when we come to the Midwest. And Jim Tomey is my mom's favorite player, right? Um, I faced him a couple of times. I've done well. I struck him out a few times. And, and I'm like feeling good about it. My mom's favorite player. Her son strikes him out. Feeling good, right? So in Chicago uh, at U.S. Cellular Field, it, it was old, new Comiskey, whatever you want to call it, the tunnel behind where the players, the clubhouses are, the walk from the clubhouse to the bus or to the, the family room 
is like a three quarters of a mile walk. It is ridiculous. And so some guys at that status have some golf carts and Jim mm-hmm. told me I was walking towards the family room one day, like on our last day in Chicago to go say goodbye to my family. And Tommy's in his golf cart and he goes, Hey, Blev, hop in. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this guy knows my name. That's amazing. Um, hops in. He's like, where are you headed? Your family room. And I said, yeah. And he's talking to me and he's like, yeah, you got a great curveball." And he's like, you know, uh, I've heard nothing but good things about you. He has, we have the same agency. I've run into him a few times since he really is one of the nicest human beings on the planet, but he was like, look, I think you got a good career here. Uh, let me go drop you off. So I hopped on and got a chance to banter back and forth. And I mentioned to him that my mom's an Indians fan and uh, he was her favorite player. And he goes, Oh really? Is your mom here? And I was like, yeah, he goes, can I, can I meet her? And so he dropped me off, met my mom, gave her like a huge hug, talked to her for like 10 minutes nicest human being on the planet. And to this day, I, I, I'll be forever grateful for that until he got traded to the twins and I'm facing him as an A in Minnesota. And I'm like, yeah, this is a nice guy. You know, I fall behind 2-0 and he hits a home run straight away center over the batter's eye. And I'm like, oh man, was he nice? to me to psych me out or did he talk to my mom just to get to the me? long con the <laughs> long, played con. The long game uh then he hit another home run the next day over the flagpole and right like the two biggest home runs i've ever gotten given up distance wise back to back the next time i faced him after he he had a conversation with my mom so i actually ran into him he really is the nicest guy he had no ulterior motives but it definitely worked in his favor because i'm up there i'm like feeling good about myself. This guy knows I'm good. Then he reminds me that he's a hall of famer and he hit 600 home runs with, with, you know, a combined probably 1100 feet off of the two balls that he smashed off me. So. Yeah. He's like, he's like, yeah, you have a really good curveball, Jerry. You should throw that against me. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> he was getting in yeah. your head about your repertoire. I love that. Yeah. So he, he used some gamesmanship and not that he needed it to, to beat me, but he definitely, um, you know, sweet talk to my mom into thinking he's like just a nice guy that my yeah. son, you know, he's he's not taking food off my son's plate. But then he hits like the two biggest home runs I've ever seen live. And it's just a, a, a reminder that there's some great players out there that are way better than me. Well, the takeaway being Jim Tomey, good guy, great player. Um, <laughs> Great guy, great player. Great guy, great player. Uh, just a reminder, everybody, to subscribe to the Shane Anything Podcast, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Another reminder that Shane Anything is brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets and the network more people rely on. It's only on Verizon. Jerry, always a pleasure. Thank you for doing this. And uh, we'll talk to you in a couple weeks, my friend. All right. Thanks, Doug. Can't wait for Whiplash. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. I think you will. 